Well, the origin story of this whole investigation that's loomed over the president for a year now is that in, in May of 2016, uh, George Papadopoulos, a newly appointed foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, uh, is, in, is in London and he's having a, a, a boozy night of drinking uh, at, a, uh, at an upscale uh, Kensington bar. And uh, he's with an Austra a top Australian diplomat, and, and he let slip the fact that uh, Russia's got dirt on Hillary Clinton. Now, we now know from court documents that have been released by uh, Bob Mueller's investigators that at that point, uh, Papadopoulos knew that Russia had, quote, thousands of her emails. Um, and this is well before anybody knew about uh, hacked emails, well before emails were being released publicly. So in July, when those emails start to trickle out, you can see the American intelligence agencies start to get to concerned that, wait a minute, what, what's happening here uh, with these Russia cyber operations? And then they learn from the Australians that there's this chance that people in the Trump campaign knew in advance about those emails. Obviously, that is what triggers, that's what mm -hmm. gets that concern going early on. But you also get this profile of George Papadopoulos uh, and two different versions here. You have the Trump camp that's trying to portray him as a coffee boy, but also in the reporting here on this article, you know, this is a guy also who was trying to set up a meeting with the Egyptian president and, and, and President I Trump, did. also outlining, uh, you know, his first major uh, foreign policy speech uh, for the president here. So, so what is it here and where does that, where, where does that get reconciled at all, if at all? Right. I mean, obviously, uh, George Papadopoulos was a, a very ambitious advisor um, and was taken seriously or not seriously from time to time by people high up in the Trump campaign. But look, he was he was asked to edit Trump's first major foreign policy speech. And, and as we reported, he helped broker a meeting, uh, uh, you know, a high level uh, Egyptian meeting with uh, with uh, Donald Trump. And and this idea that he's just a coffee boy, it, it, unfortunately, it's become sort of a talking point, and it, it ignores a lot of the, the facts we uncovered in a number of emails. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the Russians clearly saw him as a way into the Trump campaign. Some of the emails we've been able to see are just remarkable, where people saying, uh, Russian intermediaries saying, I'd like to become a campaign surrogate. I'd like to quietly yeah. go out and write op-eds for you or speak on, on the campaign's behalf without acknowledging uh, you know, my role. Fascinating uh, in the reporting saying that these spies look into peripheral players here to get that leverage, to get that insight. Exactly. Maybe they saw this guy as one of them. Talk about the timing here, especially as it plays into uh, the larger investigation picture here, especially, you know, you, you think about it and, and, and sitting on this as far as the, the Australian diplomats sitting on it for, for a couple of months before coming out with it. How does that all come into play, especially with Mueller looking in and then the plea deal? Yeah, I mean, so we don't know why the Australians didn't come to the United States in those those months from May to July. Now, uh, we know that the United States didn't really take, the United States mm -hmm. government didn't really take the hacking uh, totally seriously until the emails started to get released publicly. And that changed their thinking that this was like a weaponization of the, of the democratic hacking. And so, I mean, it's certainly plausible that the Australians, that that was a passing comment that didn't have a lot of significance until suddenly, oh, wait, that guy said there were a lot of emails, and now there are a lot of emails showing up on the Internet, so that maybe they didn't make the connection to that. We don't actually have real clarity into why the Australians waited so long. Well, when it comes to your sources, fill us in on the timeline when it comes to that. Is this something that the Times have been, you know, sitting on for a while, working on it for some time? And then the reason... Why we ask, if you look at this put together, you know, you have the GOP, the president in recent days, they've had that narrative come together and saying, you know what, when it comes to this and when it comes to the attacks, you have this, the dossier, the steel dossier coming out and you have this that may, you know, throw cold water on that altogether. But when it comes to these sources and you have the president's tweet, they're saying who these, quote, sources might have been. Um, talk about that when it comes to your reporting and, and who these sources are, especially at a time when, when these sources, you know, are anonymous. Sure. So this is something that my colleagues and I have been working on for a long time. Um, I mean, George Papadopoulos has been, uh, you know, a obvious reporting target since 
since documents were released this uh, this fall showing that he was cooperating with Mueller's investigators. I mean, look, we uh, we were we were pretty transparent about who we we're talking to. We we're talking to uh, current and former U.S. government and foreign officials with direct knowledge of uh, of the Australians' role in this and. Uh, and the question of whether or not the the Steele dossier, where this is this uh, former British spy, uh, you know, who was hired um, through a lawyer uh, as part of the Clinton campaign's efforts to collect information on Donald Trump, the fact that the Steele dossier uh, may have been the, you know, the trigger for this investigation. Mm -hmm. That that's been pretty clearly not the case for a long time, and we saw John Brennan testify uh, earlier this year that he was seeing intelligence that Russians were trying to suborn uh, members of the Trump campaign, and that's that was something he was concerned about. And of course, we didn't know what that was. Uh, I think we now know that uh, at least one of the triggering events for this was George Papadopoulos. Uh, Having having a little too much to drink and uh, and and letting slip one detail too many. Well, and it makes you wonder how far the chain did it go. Uh, have you seen any evidence of higher ups learning about this? If that's the case, is it because there are none that, that he kept it that he just said, "I'm closing my tab. I'm out. This is as far as it's going to get," or you know, the, maybe there are other sources about this that are just holding back. So we've seen uh, a number of emails, and we quoted from a number of emails uh, that uh, that George Papadopoulos exchanged. Uh, with members of the campaign and with uh, his foreign contacts. We didn't see any evidence that showed that Papadopoulos passed that information hmm. uh, about Russian hacked emails to higher ups in the campaign. Now, we, if, he, if he told it to somebody in the Australian government, if he recognized it was significant and interesting and he was trying to be on the make in the campaign, would he have told somebody in the campaign? Yeah. That's, that is a, a, a clear question that I think reporters are trying to answer. I'm sure Bob Mueller has sure. asked uh, Papadopoulos that and has asked others about that. We've not seen any evidence that George Papadopoulos shared that information with anybody in the campaign. And Spe that's a key question. And speaking to that, Matt, if he never showed up at the uh, Kensington Wine Room or if he just did one round instead of having a, this, you know, night of heavy drinking, as you report, uh, would you have a report on this? Would we know about it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, hi history is weird in the way in the way it lines up sometimes. Um, I, I don't know. I have to assume that given the given the hacking mm -hmm. and uh, you know given the many contacts between the uh, members of the Trump campaign and uh, Russians and Russian intermediaries, can contacts that have been falsely denied. Um, I have to assume that there would have still been an investigation, yeah. um, but I don't know. Where, I don't know yeah. if we'd be where we are today if Without not that. for that conversation. You said history is weird, and so are the circumstances. When you have been one too many, <laughs> some of us know. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.